Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, if you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. And as you're turning to Ephesians chapter 2, if you'll just uh, join me in prayer. Uh, Lord, we just love you, and we're just excited uh, for you just to reveal yourself in a new and fresh way this morning. Uh, Will you just give us your mind? Will you give us your clarity? Would you give us your heart? Would you open up the word in our lives, and would you allow us to see you anew and afresh this morning? May we hear your voice this morning. We desperately need you, Jesus, in your precious and holy name. Amen. Uh, I was told this week that I sound like an old man on life support. I think is what somebody, I think is how they said it. Uh, so my voice goes out. I apologize. I've had a uh, scratchy throat all week. But uh, we've been looking at Ephesians chapter 2. And... Uh, I wanted to read the first few verses again with you, and then I just want to dive into it. Again, just as a reminder, Paul is talking about the demonstration of God's power. What does the power of God look like in our day and age? Again, we've been walking through the the first chapter, and at the very end of the first chapter, he's talking about the overwhelming, immeasurable, indescribable power of God. And he says, you can't explain it, you can't define it, but God's power is... It's amazingly, it's phenomenal, it's, I don't know, what words do you use to describe God's power? Paul, Paul just fails at his attempt. But he says God is in this state, he has this overwhelming iscus, this strength, it's flowing, and creating this in our lives. And he says, let me give you two examples, Jesus and you. And we've been walking through this idea of you are the demonstration of God's power in this day and age. So chapter 2, verse 1, Paul writes, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. I want to look at verses 4 and 5 with you this morning. But before we can get there, Again, as we've been saying, you cannot understand the immensity of what God has done. You cannot understand the overwhelming nature of God himself. You cannot understand what God has done in your life until you understand what he has brought you out of. And until we can understand where we have been or where we have come from and what our, what our internal makeup has been and how, how far different that is from this, uh, we, we can't understand this in its totality. So again, if you could just bear with me, I want to paint this picture again uh, in verses 1 through 3 before we can understand truly the, the immensity, the tremendous, overwhelming statement that Paul's making in verses 4 and 5. Okay. So chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Paul says, do you know who you are? You are a group of people who have not just done wrong things. It's not just a group of people, well, yeah, you've done something you probably shouldn't have done. It's not just a group of people who, all right, well, you sinned. You're a group of people who are dead. And the terminology is embalmed. It's the idea of, you're, 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 hey, you're food for worms. Your body is just disintegrating. You're, you're dead. Dead, 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 dead. Not just partly dead, but dead, dead. As if there's a difference. You're dead. Okay? You're dead. What'd I say? Good. So this is, there's no life in it. You're completely dead. This is not, well, he might be able to get up with a lot of coffee. This is dead, dead. 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 And if you don't understand the dead... 
You cannot understand life. See, what would it look like if we realized that we were dead? Not just dead, but dead, dead. Because until you understand that, you cannot understand this. Paul goes, let me describe your dead deadness. I'm making this all up. You know, this, I've never heard of dead deadness, but I like it. Uh, we're going to use it. <clears throat> what does dead deadness look like? He says, let me explain it. He says, you're dead in trespasses and sins. But in a fuller explanation, he goes on in verses 2 and 3. He says, you once walked according to the course of the world. What does he mean? The word there, walked, again, is this idea of lifestyle. It's a way of living. It's not just, well, yeah, I was walking on the world, walking on earth. It's your whole attitude, your whole lifestyle, your whole makeup, your whole mindset is of the world itself. Meaning the culture, the nature, the, hey, the systems, the, all of that is just, it is of the world. So the culture, the world has a, its own identity. It has its own makeup. It has its own lifestyle. The world tells you how to dress. The world tells you what is success. The world tells you, hey, how to spend your free time. The world tells you, the world tells you, the world tells you, the world tells you. You can flip on the television and it tells you a lot. And it's almost as if that has defined who we are. That we don't get a voice outside of this. We don't hear anything outside of this. This is who we are. Here's God speaking. We don't care. Uh, here's God moving in our lives. We could care less. Why? Because this defines us, not God. And Paul says, this is who you've all been wrapped up in. In fact, if you looked at the world, there's no difference between you and the world. And I don't know if you've looked at recent statistics, but the state of the church nowadays is that when you look at the modern church today, uh, there seems to be fewer and fewer differences between those who go to church and those who are in the world. Uh, for example, <clears throat> uh, divorce rates. The divorce rates in the world is actually less than that in the church. And my, my reasoning is, is probably because there's less people getting married in the world now, and then they're just all living together. So they're so the divorce rate's higher in the church. But you realize that the similarity, there, there's not a big difference. Uh, you look at teenagers today. What, what is the difference between a Christian teenager and a worldly teenager? Besides the fact that one goes to church, one doesn't go to church, what's the difference? Well, it's becoming more and more blurry. Uh, see, they're, they're both addicted to sex. Uh, they're both... Uh, they're both obsessed with video games. They're, they're both using swear words. They're, or maybe less kind of swear words. They're not harsher swear words. Harsher swear words, less harsher swear words. Substitute swear words. Maybe that's what I should say. The, 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 the lines between the two are blurry. And this has defined who we are. Paul says that is not to be so. But there should be such a radical difference between a Christian and the world that when the world looks at the Christian, they go, you're not one of us. In fact, throughout the Gospels, or throughout the Epistles, there's this idea that the world looks at this and goes, you are an alien. Why? Not that you're some brain zombie thing. It's, you're, you're so different from what the world looks like that you are strange, you're a foreigner, you're just odd, you don't fit in. Why? Because you're not of this. You're not of the world. And there should be no question in anyone's mind when they look at a Christian, they should go, ah, that is a Christian. Why? Because their whole makeup is completely different than this. See, it, it, it drives me nuts when, uh, we were, when we've been going to the Truth Project. Uh, Del Tackett would mention this, and I thought it was very profound. He goes, you know, when, when, when employers are looking to hire an employee, the very first people they should go is, oh, I have to hire a Christian. Why? Well, because they're always honest. Uh, they never cheat. Uh, they always tell the truth. They, they always do the work. They come in on time. They never just slack off. They're the, they're the most dependable, most reliable workers anywhere. I'd rather hire a Christian than anyone else. However, it seems like in our modern culture, everyone goes, ooh, you're a Christian. I don't want to hire you. Why? Well, because, yeah, hey, you're the one slacking off. You're the one that's, does that make sense? This should not define us. He should define us. 
And Paul says, anytime that this begins to define who you are, then this is no longer defining you. The moment the world defines you, Jesus is no longer defining you. He says, the world, hey, you, you've been, you, your whole life has been caught up in this. This is who you were. I'm talking past tense. This is who you, this is who you once were. You're all about the world. He goes on to say, not only that, but your life was lived according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. The whole mindset of the demonic nature, the whole fleshly, self-sourcing, selfish, obsessed, that, that's been your whole lifestyle. It's always been about me. It's always been about my desires. It's been about fulfilling my pleasure. It's been about what I desire. It's been about, hey, what I crave. It's been about, I don't care about you. It's all about me. And that literally, that spirit is energizing my life. And last week we looked at this, I, this comparison, this contrast that Paul's making, and that here's God, and he is, the word that he's using in uh, verse 19 is that God is flowing, he's energizing the spirit-filled life, and here's in this, in this verse in chapter, chapter 2, verse 2, here's the demonic flowing and sourcing and energizing the demonic life. So you are going to be, there, there is this flow in your life, there is going to be this energizing, energizing movement in your life, the question is, is, from where is it coming from? Either you're going to have the world flowing its energy and its life and its attitude and its flow inside of you, producing who you are, or you're going to have God flowing himself and his life and his nature and his attitude into your life, and he's going to produce who he is inside of your life. Something is going to energize you. It's either going to be the world and the flesh, the demonic hell itself, that attitude, or it's going to be Jesus. It's going to be one of the two. And he says, let me tell you the, what you've been. Your whole makeup in the past has been this world idea, and the whole attitude and the flow of the world and of the demonic, and it was just that, hey, the whole Satan himself, he's just flowing his whole being inside of you, and that is defined who you are, and he is the one that is energizing your very being. This is who you've been. Now, he goes on, and he says in verse 3, uh, among whom also we have once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh. And again, this idea is passive, meaning you don't get a choice in this. It means it's not that, well, I'm conducting the lusts of my flesh. It's not that idea. Uh, the word they're conducted is this turn upside down, turn over. It's like the idea of being put in a dryer and just in the spin cycle. A dryer does not have spin cycles. Uh, that would be a washer. You're in a washing machine. <laughs> See how much I do wash my clothes. So here you are in a washer, and you're in the spin cycle, and it's just flipping you upside down, and you don't have a choice in the matter, and you're just, you're just spinning over out of control, and you're, you just have to do the, whatever the lusts of the flesh tell you. And again, lust is not just a, a sexual thing. Lust here is anything that is not of God. It's greed. It's the whole pride. It's the whole, it's the whole fleshly makeup of life. And here you are caught in this cycle of just, it's telling you to do something, and you're just like, I have to do it. Why? Because it has control and authority and power over you. And you're like, well, I don't have a choice in that? No. Paul says you're caught in that cycle. You have no choice. What you do have a choice in, though, he goes on to say, you're also fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. So it wasn't that you're just caught in the spin cycle of, the, of sin. Yes, that was happening. But in the very back of your mind, you're like, oh, sin. And it says you are fulfilling those desires. That your flesh, your, your self, your, the, the sin nature within you is craving something. And so it desires this thing. And what does it say? You're fulfilling it. Which means you're actively participating and doing it. And again, last week we mentioned that the word fulfill is not just, yeah, all right, I did it. It's the word poyeo, which is that creative inside flow idea. So here's your flesh and here's your... Here's the whole sin within your life, the sin nature, as Paul would call it. And it literally rises up within you and says, oh, wouldn't this be something fun? And it says that literally bubbling forth within you, you get this desire, and you're like, oh, how can I creatively bring it about? How, how can I turn within myself and come up with a solution, a, a unique, perverse way to fulfill the lusts of the flesh and the mind? That it wasn't I was just participating in it, I was creatively finding new ways to pull it out, pull it off. And, if you, and again, if you look at Romans chapter 1, Paul goes overboard and just says, 
things are getting more and more perverse, as if there's something within us that just causes us to just churn and come up with brand new ways of sinning. As if there's, hey, how else can I create and twist it so it's even more evil and perverse? That's what he's talking about. So here we are, caught in this whole web of junk. And Paul looks at that and says, that is completely dead. Not just dead, but dead dead. And obviously God has a huge problem on his hands. Because now you have, and see I've been wrestling all week of how do I give words to the immensity of this? Uh, and I, I, I'm probably going to fail horribly today. But you look at this, you realize this is so against the character and the nature of God. God is holy. No, he's not. Uh, God is not holy. He is not even holy, holy. Our God is so holy, the only way to describe him is holy, holy, holy. Which obviously is really holy. You understand, that's the emphasis of the scripture. Anytime you repeat something, it's, it's done for emphasis. So our God's not holy. I do not serve a holy God. I serve a God who is holy, 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 which means he's not just holy, he's holy. Glad you're excited. <laughs> you realize that this, he is perfect. He is absolutely perfect. What does a perfect, holy, holy, holy God has to do with this. This is junk. This is worse than dead, dead. Do you see that? There, there should be no avenue for relationship. There should be nothing, nothing within God that says, I like that. There should be nothing within that just drives him. There should be nothing that he looks at when he looks at this that just says, oh, there's something beautiful there. This is grotesque. Now, one of the writers in the Gospels, or uh, in the New Testament, said that if you are not like his nature, you have to stay away. God and sin cannot mesh. So unless you are perfect, you cannot enter his throne room. This is not perfect. This is not even holy. Surely not holy, 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 but definitely not holy. It's dead. In fact, it's dead, dead. That was a joke. Do you see the contrast? How can a perfect, holy, holy, holy God look at this and say, you know what, I like that. I, in fact, I think that's very beautiful. Oh, in fact, i got to have a relationship with that. The similarity is me, I know this is a horrible example. It's like me walking out to a cow pasture and looking at, Something that's fallen on the ground. <laughs> this, this is, I mean, I'm talking about a contrast. And I know it's a horribly bad one. This is the best I can come up with. And you're looking at the contrast, and, you're, and you look at it, and you go, I love that. In fact, I think that's very beautiful. In fact, I want relationship. Do, do you see what God has done? Here is who we have been. There is nothing, there's no hope. There is, there, we are dead. And then verse 4 comes along, and Paul says, but God. That was the time you jump up, scream, shout, and wave the white hankies. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he has loved us, he looked at that pile of deadness and says, oh, I love it. See how foreign and odd this is? And even while we were dead in that, he made us alive together in Christ. Now, I would like to open up, if I may, this idea of but God. Uh, if, if you were to ask me, condense the entirety of the gospel into one word, I would say Jesus. And this week I've been thinking, if you were to ask me, how would you convince the entirety of the gospel into two words? I would say, but God. Why? Because the whole essence of the gospel is contained in two words, but God. 
Why? Because God looked at our deadness, and he just said, but I cannot have it. Do you see how immense that is? So I'm saying, I cannot, Paul, I read Paul, and he, he pulls out superlatives, and if you know me, I have, I'm a fanatic for superlatives. I have this deep, passionate love obsession for superlatives. And if you don't know what a superlative, it's those words like phenomenal, rad, tubular, stellar, bodacious, incredible, great. I got a whole list of them. You can't, how do you describe something that's indescribable? You can't, so you pull out a superlative. Oh, that's phenomenal. Oh, that's so tubular. Okay, not many people use that, many, that one anymore. Oh, that's so radical. See, no one uses that one either. That's so bodacious. That one needs to come back. Oh, that, that's the bomb. That's so bad, which means good. I mean, does that make sense? How do you describe something that's indescribable? You pull out a superlative. That's why I love them. Oh, because there's all these things that I cannot describe or I don't want to describe. So I'm like, ah, oh, superlative. So Paul does that. And he uses two of them in our passage. He says, our God is rich in mercy. That's a superlative. And he's great in his love. That's a superlative. How do you describe his mercy and his love? You can't. Paul goes, I'm not going to even try. I'm just going to pull out a superlative and say, good luck. Understand it. But when you look in this contrast, do you see, the, do you see what Paul is doing here? He, he's laying this whole framework saying, this is who you have been. This is your whole makeup. This was your whole attitude. But let me tell you something. Our God looked at that and said, I can't have it. Uh, see, he's given this contrast between the devil's blueprint for mankind and God's blueprint for mankind. Uh, he, he's, giving, he's giving this contrast between God's perfection and man's demise. And he's saying they are so radically in opposition to one another, they shouldn't touch within a 10-mile pole. I mean, nothing can get close to God that is not perfect and holy. And yet, what has God done? He's really reached into this muck and he's brought forth life where there's supposed to be death. And you realize the, the only thing that this should have won us, the only thing that this should have given us, was hell for all eternity. That was the price of this. That was what results from this. This is the evidence of this. And yet Paul says, if you're in that state, I have good news. Now, he could have described any of the facets of God. And I find it so wonderfully fascinating that he describes only two, and it's the only two that you care about if you're in this state. If you are deader than a doornail, if you are dead dead in sin and trespasses, I, I don't care if God is patient. I don't care if God is joyful. Hey, I'm in a dead, dead state, and I can't get out of it. There's, there's nothing I can do. In fact, the more I do, only produces more dead deadness. So what do I care about? Oh, is my God loving? And if he is, is he going to be merciful to my dead deadness? And Paul says, oh, let me describe our God to you. Verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he has loved us. Our God is merciful and our God is loving. And these are not attributes that he has. He's talking about his nature and his character. It's a state of being, which you can see in the verse. It's who is. It's a state of being. This is not something that, yeah, God sometimes has mercy. Sometimes he's this mean, nasty God who stomps on our heads. See, there's none of that. See, Paul does not look at this and say, hey, you are living in this dead deadness, and God's going to stomp you on your face. He's, he's going to send you straight to hell. He's going to, that's not what Paul says. He says, this is who you were. Hey, this is who you've been. Let me describe what God has done in your life. If you would just embrace him and hold tight to him, can I describe what's taking place? 
He says, our God is so merciful. He is rich in mercy. The word there, rich, is this idea of overabundance. It means not just monetarily wealth, but this, it's just uh, milk chocolate is okay. Dark chocolate is rich. There is a dark chocolate richness that cannot be described. And milk chocolate is just pitiful in comparison. <laughs> Amen. Uh, it's that idea. See, it's not just, well, God has mercy. He is rich in mercy. He, it is, it's not that he has a lot of money in his mercy. It's, there, there's so much of it. It's so, so thick. It just, when you put it upon your tongue, it's just like, oh, start chocolate. Rich. Mercy, again, is this idea that it's this loving kindness, it's this goodness, but it's something that you don't deserve. Uh, illustration. Uh, you have this king, and someone gets caught doing something they're not supposed to be doing, so they get brought before a king, and they're, they're guilty, overwhelmingly guilty. You can't get out of it. All these witnesses, punishment is death. And they look at the king and go, King, will you, will you give me mercy? What is he asking for I deserve death, but I'm appealing to who you are. Instead of death, could you give me prison time? Would you give me freedom? Would you give me something other than death? Because that's what I deserve. This deserves death. Yes, you are dead dead, but it deserves a deadness that's even beyond the dead deadness. And we didn't have to ask God for it. We didn't have to appeal to God for it. God just said, I am merciful. Embrace me, and you don't have to be there. I'm a God of mercy. Uh, we keep throwing out this story all the time as an illustration, but in, Jesus tells the parable of the man who comes up to the, to the king, and he owns the king millions and millions and millions of dollars, and he goes, King, I can't, I can't pay it back. I've spent all this money of yours. I can't pay it back. Uh, I, 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 hey, will you just give me more time so I can work it off? And what does the king do? Oh, I'll just forgive the debt. That's mercy. Hey, the man didn't deserve it. But man, the king just, oh, I forgive you. Ah, I'm giving you mercy. How does God show forth his mercy? Oh, it's in his love. But what's his love? Oh, it's great. It's not just great, it's phenomenal. See, Paul didn't have all these great superlatives, apparently, because I would have picked, oh, he has a bodacious love. He has an overwhelming, immeasurable, phenomenal, incredible love. See, that's how I would have written it. Ah, our God's love is... Oh. Now, the word their love, again, is the word agape. It's, it's not just something God has. First John says, God is love. That's this love. That is this God love that just cannot be quenched. It cannot be slowed down. It just, In fact, a great picture of this love is you hang Jesus upon a cross... You spit in his face, you bleed his back, throw a crown of thorns on his, on his head, and yet the love is still gushing forth. Why? Because he loves you. Hey, you cannot stop this kind of love. In fact, you can do whatever you want to this kind of love, and it's still aggressively coming after you. Uh, Paul describes this love. He, uh, he says that this love is patient. He said this love is kind. He says it doesn't envy. And it's not very boastful. He says it's never arrogant, it's never rude, it, never, it doesn't assist on its own way, it's not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rather it rejoices in, it, in truth, it bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things, and it never, ever, ever, ever ends. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13. It's that word, love. Not just love, but God love, agape. And Paul uses the word twice in our passage. He says that this love, this, this love is how God is loving us. That God is love, and it's that out of that very nature of his love that he's pouring that forth, and he says he's loving us. Well, how is that love being shown? How is it demonstrated? Ah! Oh, Jesus. Uh, you know the verse very well, but John 3.16. For God so... For God greatly agape the world that he sent his son. Hey, that whoever, 
would believe on him, would not perish, but have life out of deadness. That you would be yanked out of deadness and brought forth into life, and they would live in the state of life. Uh, in Romans uh, chapter 8, listen to this verse. For those who live according to the flesh, this, this whole mindset here, who, for those who live according to the world, for those who live according to that whole, that whole makeup, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds, which doesn't mean just your mind, your intellect, it means your whole orientation of life, it means your whole makeup. You set your entire life on the things of the flesh. So obviously if you're of the flesh, you live your life according to this. That makes sense. But if you live according to the Spirit, you set your mind upon the things of the Spirit. Your whole life and orientation is that of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. For the carnal, the worldly fleshly nature, is that enmity means at war with God. See, this cannot have relationship with this. Uh, John's, uh, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of this is death. Yes, you're dead, but the, but the result of this is dead, deadness, and eternal hell. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, Paul's just over and over setting up a contrast. In our passage, he says, this is who you've been. But yet, let me tell you who our God is. Our God is a God who just, he is so full of mercy, he is so full of love, that he looks at the pile of whatever and just says, I have to have a relationship with it. I cannot stand it. In fact, if I just, if I don't have a relationship, I may just explode. I know it's not possible, but go with me. See, how does a holy, 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 holy God have a relationship with something that is so, 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 so unholy. It can't. And again, maybe I should change my illustration with the, the whole cow dung thing. Uh, here I am, and there's a dead cockroach who has made its home in a pile of cow dung. And it's dead. It's not alive. It's dead. And when I look at it, just something stirs within me. And I say, oh, I love it. And I have to have relationship with it. And I'm so full of mercy and love, I, I have to have it. But I, like, I don't want to get my hands dirty. My parents will attest to the fact I don't like to get my hands dirty. So how do I scoop up in the middle of fresh cow dung and, and rescue a dead cockroach and have a relationship with it? I know this is a horrible example. It's impossible. But you realize what God has done is not merely looked at dead deadness and brought it to life. It's not me looking at a dead cockroach and bringing it to life. If I brought it to life, it would only result in more death. See, if God really looked at our dead deadness and said, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll allow you to have life, and so I bring you into life. If he did that, we'd still be dead. So it wasn't merely that he looked into the dead deadness and brought forth life. He looked in the dead deadness and gave us his life. It's me looking at a dead cockroach in a pile of fresh cow manure and says, and I say, Rather than just bringing the cockroach to life, I'm going to come and give it my life and then remove it from the cow dung and place it on a beautiful banquet table full of its choicest foods so it can just skip away and frolic into eternity. <laughs> yeah. Does that make sense? How do, you, how do you describe this? You have a perfect God who wants relationship with the most unperfect thing. And it wasn't that he just raised this to life. That would have been incredible. But it wasn't that he raised it to life. It was that he inserted his life into this and produced life, his life, into this. Which means what? 
it no longer is defined by this. If it is his life, it now is defined by this, not by that. So the life that we live, as Paul would say, is now lived in Christ Jesus our Lord, who is no longer defined by this. This is what used to define us. But it is him who now defines us. Why? It is his life that has really brought me from death into life. Do you see the immensity of the, the demonstration of the power of God? Here I am in dead deadness, and God reaches into my dead deadness and yanks me into life, but it's not just my life. He, he brings me into his life. And now I live not my life. I merely am lived by his life. I don't think I, I read this yes, or last week, but Ian Thomas said, in order to be a man, it takes God. The actual quote is, it takes God to be a man. If you were going to be a man as God designed him to be, it takes God to live it. Man, Ian Thomas says, that is, as God intended man to be, God created man to be inhabited by God for God. See, man on his own is nothing more than dead deadness. And if man is going to be what man is designed and created to be, he has to have God. Infiltrating, sourcing, flowing, living, creating his life. So man does not live his life. God lives man's life. And thus, because God lives man's life, he is exactly as man is created to be. Do you have that? And man, God keeps pressing my life is how much of this defines my life? How much of the world has, has infiltrated and, and described who I am and just... And if I'm any part of this, if this defines who I am, then, then God is not defining who I am. And I need a God who is so merciful and loving that he would take me a dead cockroach and reach into my deadness and bring forth life, not just my life, but his life. And bring me to a state where I am, this defines me. It is him and him alone. For me to live is Christ. Jesus. Uh, Lord, sometimes the gospel seems far too simple in my mind. Lord, there's no part in this whole thing that I pull off or I do. Never once does Paul say, oh, this is what I've done. This is what you can do. Lord, the whole thing is your initiative and your action and your movement upon my life. And Lord, it's as if the only thing I can do is respond. Lord, I do not want to be defined or influenced or described by the world and the culture. Lord, I need you desperately to reach into dead deadness and yank me into life, not just life, but your life. That your life and your flow and your energy and your substance is literally energizing and flowing through my veins and that, that all that I am can only be described by you and all that you are is suddenly now flowing and moving in my life and I become a man as, as you intended me to be. Why? Because you you're the definition of my life. And God, if I'm going to be a man, it's going to take you to do it. I don't know where you are this morning, but man, have you been living and defined and influenced by the culture and the world? Hey, has it been telling you how to think and how to dress and how to, how to be successful and how to find refreshment and has it infiltrated and influenced your life in any way? Do the people around you look at you and just say, oh, you must be a Christian. Why? Because you're definitely not like this world at all. Hey, it's not that clothing's bad. It's not that movies are wrong. It's not that... But hey, I want to be so tight with Jesus. That the world has no influence on my life. It doesn't describe me, it doesn't define me, it doesn't influence me, it's just, 
I'm merely an alien walking through this world and Could it be that what we desperately need is just to release ourselves and turn ourselves over to a God who is so merciful and loving? Who wants to pull us from death into life? You realize if that doesn't happen, the wages of sin is still death. And we are still going to end up in eternal torment and torture and hell. But oh, why would you want to live that way? Why would you not want God to just reach into dead deadness and yank you into life? Uh, maybe you are in life. Maybe you maybe life defines who you are. Maybe it's his life defining you, but are you experiencing that life to the fullest? Could you not get closer and tighter with him? Is his same mercy and love flowing through your veins to the people around you? Now we're just going to have a moment of response. And if God's just speaking, hey, respond. I don't care if you come to the altar. I don't care if you stand on your head. I don't care if you sit where you are. But would you just let God yank you to another level? Yank you from deadness into life? Bring you from life into life more abundant? Because it takes God to be as you are intended to be. Would you let him do it? Uh, Jesus, we just love you. We want to respond to you. And oh, God. Oh, God. Thank you. That I don't have to live in dead deadness anymore. That I can live in the grand statement of, but God and all that you're doing and accomplishing and flowing and sourcing in my life. Moments of response.